So good evening, everyone. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to this evening's program. I'm Jamie Seward, Associate Director of Affinity Engagement Programs with the Johns Hopkins Office of Alumni Relations. And I'm here with our guest speaker, Professor David Yu, Chairman of China Aviation Valuation Advisors and Asia Aviation Valuation Advisors and Professor of Finance at NYU Shanghai and Stern School. He's also a recognized expert and thought leader in cross-border investing, financing, valuation, real assets, and aviation. We're very, very lucky to have him with us tonight, and we appreciate all of you attending. So before I turn the program over to Professor Yu, I encourage you to ask any questions you have by typing them in the Zoom Q&A in the bottom of your screen. We'll have time at the end of the program to answer them. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. David Yu. Dr. Yu, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thanks for the uh, nice intro. Let me get the presentation up and running, one second. Okay, so uh, the presentation should be up. So uh, if you guys don't see it, uh, give a shout out. Um, so thanks for uh, joining us today, uh, your evening in the East Coast and uh, my early morning here in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, so uh, thanks for um, uh, having me, uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk today. I think uh, uh, you guys are joined on, so hopefully you guys are uh, interested about the topic and I'm sure let's get on with it. Um, for, for your information, uh, background, we just went over, you can look at this uh, later. But uh, essentially, uh, lots of different touch points in this in this uh, aviation finance and cross border finance space, uh, writing research, uh, as well as uh, working as a practitioner, uh, founding investment companies, uh, as well as working in uh, various private equity and other uh, advisory and board capacities. Um, Here's a book cover. Uh, the book should be coming out uh, near uh, <clears throat> by the end of this month. Uh, so I'm very excited to share with you uh, some bits from this book. All right, let's get started. For, for those people who uh, are not uh, so in, uh, uh, knowledgeable about the space, um, the global leaving, uh, leasing side, the uh, aircraft finance, it really started in, in, the, in the 40s, uh, if you can, as you can see. And 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 uh, and I'll start with uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll start with a with a global U.S. Uh, look, and then uh, as well as and then go straight into more what's going on in Asia and uh, in China. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty delineated market, so we'll get into that. And then while while after we go through this, uh, we'll go through uh, some uh, a small bit of uh, the characteristics. And what uh, we've seen from this research as well, uh, and then uh, and then lastly, uh, look at it from a, a COVID, uh, um, COVID and aviation perspective. I know uh, a lot of you guys are all stuck, uh, myself included, and uh, haven't really traveled uh, too much uh, recently. So, uh, which is a shame. So let us uh, continue here. So. <clears throat> Really, uh, it's the the leasing space and aviation finance really started in the 40s. Um, and this, if you look at this, this kind of goes back to really the old McDonnell Douglas uh, days uh, when <laughs> it was a pre uh, uh, pre merger with uh, with Boeing, uh, and and this and they actually founded their own. Uh, dedicated uh, outfit to basically do financings for aircraft, which was, uh, which was new back then. Uh, this uh, subsequently got renamed to Boeing Capital and they still exist today as the financing arm of uh, Boeing Corp, uh, financing their customer financings and, and as well as uh, leasing and other methods um, uh, to their customers. So the first deal, really, look at it, is, is a couple of old DC-9s uh, to Air West and uh, DC-8s to uh, Flying Tiger Line. So these, uh, these uh, names, if you're not familiar with it, uh, really kind of escape the uh, landscape. But this, uh, uh, while this, this paper book is not really looking into this, uh, that, that, that by itself is very fascinating history. Um, 
The, the story of the industry really encompasses two companies, at least in the beginning, uh, and, and spreading out to the rest of the industry. Uh, one in the U.S. is uh, ILFC, International Lease Finance Corp, uh, founded by Steve Hazy with two partners in California. And then the other uh, across, the, across the Atlantic in, in Ireland is uh, Guinness Peat Aviation, GPA as is more well, uh, well known as. And this was founded by uh, this uh, colorful executive, uh, Tony Ryan, uh, who was, uh, at that time, was part of Aaron Lingus, uh, and split out from that, and, and uh, Guinness Peak Group, where the name uh, came from. Uh, for some of the, uh, from some of you who might know or, or might uh, be interested, uh, Tony Ryan was also uh, the founder of, uh, of Ryan Air. Uh, which are uh, still flying today as, uh, as one of the major LCCs and, and airlines in, in Europe today. Well, it's a, it's a pretty divergent path here with the fine roads, but basically what they ended up doing is, uh, ILFC was uh, basically very on the upward swing, very successful, and uh, went public, got acquired by AIG, the big insurance group, uh, and eventually, uh, the founders uh, have parted way. Uba uh, Harzi, uh, Steve Uba Harzi, he he resigned, retired actually, and uh, at that point, uh, that that uh, ILC was had a net book book value of uh, close to forty billion dollars with uh, over a thousand aircraft. So it's quite a, quite a large uh, a company entity, and then subsequently founded another aircraft leasing company, Air Lease Corp which went in public in uh, NYC in, in 2011. On the other hand, with GPA, uh, it, it, it had a very, very good start and, um, and was quite uh, big at its peak, uh, uh, close to $4 billion, or sorry, excuse me, 4 billion euros worth of valuation and over 400 aircraft. And uh, after an attempt at going public, which failed uh, due to uh, aggressive pricing and, and, and Gulf War, uh, back then, it really <clears throat> it had to restructure, and uh, at that point, uh, GCAS really took over, and and took uh, GCAS is uh, the uh, aircraft leasing arm, uh, aviation finance leasing arm for uh, GE Capital, part of GE Corp. But uh, this kind of set it up for today. The remnants of that company actually, after the restructuring, they didn't buy the entire company. GE, GE didn't buy the entire company, and the remnants of that today, as you can see by all this M and A activity. They subsequently became Air Cap, which, funny enough, bought the uh, bought ILFC from uh, AIG Group uh, after uh, after uh, after that after the financial crisis. So, um, uh, well, and also one other thing is that the, all the GPA's employees over the year are spread out to the entire industry. So this was really the hotbed of the all the industry. You can really kind of um, look at their progression and history and where they came from. They came from these two companies in particular. Um, to give you a sense of what's going on globally, um, really there's three big outfits today uh, in the world. Um, and we'll look into China specifically onshore, but offshore we have Ireland, Singapore, and Hong Kong as the main hubs. Uh, given this history, the rich history over over uh, 40 plus years, you can see um, you can see that Ireland still dominates in this space. Well, 50% of the world's fleet is domiciled uh, still in Ireland, and most of the major uh, leasing companies who have own aircraft are still domiciled there. So they are still um, a very big hub in, in this uh, in this space. And and primarily, some of the reasons is you know government support, this big support uh, for this industry in terms of tax, ease of um, use of service, uh, et cetera, and the service entities that surround it. Uh, and they had a very heads up start from that, from that angle. Um, if you recall, if you guys know geography, it's still up in North of, of Europe. So in, in that, in that sense, it's, a uh, it, it's quite close to continental Europe and that obviously helped from, from a European point of view. Uh, uh, two more kind of more recent upstarts in Asia would be would be in Singapore with uh, the ALS scheme, their local scheme. They basically was like, look, we've had aircraft leasing for a while. We want to kind of come after this uh, as a segment space aircraft financing, and they really started this off in 2012. 
their main entity there is uh, is Boca, and it's a public like Bank of China Aviation, which is a publicly listed um, uh, company in, in Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong, which is the last upstart, really wanted to capitalize on the Chinese uh, capital outflow inflow aspect, and this uh, really got started in 2017. So it just really kind of started. So these are the primary sources. Uh, the rest of it can be spread out in your normal jurisdiction. Um, offshore uh, countries, uh, some in the US. US, as you can see, is not in the top uh, top of listings here, uh, mostly due to tax and other, other concerns. <clears throat> well, if you look at it from, uh, from what's happening in China, this is, this, is a, this is a story of a global industry, but at the same time, you've got to look at kind of different pieces because all of them have different types of uh, uh, development schemes. And at the same time, this is seeing where capital is flowing from. Uh, it's an important piece in a capital intensive industry. Uh, and we'll get into the pricing in a little bit. Um, for those who don't know, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, uh, foreign aircraft leasing has actually been uh, around for a while, since, uh, since 1979. So it's really, it, it's not a, a new concept. Uh, while people think of it as new, even here in Asia, it's it's been around for a long time. And if you look at even going back further than just from from the 1970s, you can see that the manufacturer Hanover, which became later known as uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, were, were were quite active uh, even in China in, in the 1980s, and, and they were they did the first deals um, uh, over there uh, in China. 1980s. So it, it's uh, there is a, a significant history of foreign leasing players uh, and financing players in, in, uh, onshore as well. Mostly, again, very much tax driven. Um, this doesn't say much about the U.S. side, but the U.S. was quite active in the 80s, 90s, as well with them. Mostly based on tax uh, tax scheme leasing, tax leverage leasing, and this really uh, got shut off when the tax laws got rechanged, and, and really that, that basically moved all these structures, which is all tax driven, right, uh, offshore into other jurisdictions uh, like we have today. Um, Japanese optimized tax lease, uh, JOL, uh, uh, other variations have uh, are still in existence today, so. Again, those are more premised not on almost an investment income point of view, but rather how much tax can be saved and, and, and uh, utilized uh, for, for other purposes. So uh, really this, this newest onslaught of leasing really started in 2007. So you see it, uh, this is when the, when the laws were changed where the banks and big banking groups um, most of them were uh, state-owned enterprises, which are owned by the state, as, as, as the name implies. Uh, really, this is kind of the kicking off aspect of, uh, of the next iteration. And, and, and through this, uh, the top players today are, are uh, derived from uh, this era, the first bit. And these are where you see the big major uh, leasing plan, like ICBC leasing, like CDB leasing. These are the first uh, tranched uh, issuances. Um, you can tell, uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a map. Onshore in China, it's all about free trade zones. Free trade zones are areas where you have special uh, rights and privileges. And a lot of it, it comes, it has to do with taxation, uh, preferential tax tradition and, and how uh, it's governed in terms of regulatory aspects because they're, 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 uh, they're inscribed in their own uh, borders. So with this, as you see, there's, there's quite a bit of, of them all throughout China. And the most famous ones, uh, if you think about it, are, are really in the news uh, these days. There's Hong Kong and next door in Shenzhen as originally one of the, the, the original uh, free trade zone, but uh, or free trade city, and for that matter, but uh, what where it is for aviation, it's it's in Tianjin, uh, predominantly Tianjin free trade zone. Uh, that's right outside of uh, Beijing, as you can see in the map here. But uh, that uh, encompasses over eighty percent of all the aircraft uh, that is uh, actually domiciled in China. And then this this realm really started around the same time, two thousand seven, two thousand eight time. So it's 
It's um, uh, the other zones are more upstarts. There's a couple more upstarts, uh, Shanghai Free Trade Zone, um, as well as uh, some others have aircraft, but this is predominantly. And, and I'm the company uh, Kava, the, the Chinese entity is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, basically is also based there. And we have uh, uh, the official partnership with, with, the, with the entity, with the, um, with the region to help grow, grow it. Uh, as well on the other earlier aspects. On the airline side, just to give you a quick color, color flavoring, if you guys don't know, there's the big three today, Air China, China Southern, and China Eastern. But these three big airline groups, uh, all state-owned, uh, encompass about 80% of the traffic uh, in, in China. So they're quite substantial in that aspect. But you see today, it's actually really kind of pieced off. They were all at one, uh, at one point, all part of CAAC Airlines back in the uh, pre, uh, pre-60s, uh, pre-60s onward. So this goes, really goes back to the really kind of the founding of the Republic, uh, the, the People's Republic back in, in 49. So if you see, if you see it, then they got really kind of splintered as subsidiaries and then over time became really the big three. And this will come out. For those of you who travel to China, uh, this is just something that's interesting. There's only about, a 20% of all available airspace in, in the, that's actually for civil aviation. So this is one of the one of the major reasons why um, there's a lot of congestion in, in back in Not today, of course, but uh, this is all, I would say, pre-COVID uh, observations. Uh, many people always ask me about this question uh, as they travel there. Okay, so uh, I know we don't have too much uh, time today, so I'm just trying to cover some very, very big pictures, and I hope you have some time to more read some of the nuanced aspects from the book, or or ask me later. I can always point you to some other resources as well. But um, I would say, look, look at the historical. This is a historical trend of air global airline growth. You can see, even with all these big uh, exogenous shocks, uh, airlines still does quite well. And uh, yeah, I know today, if you look at it today, if you add, put that in what's going on with COVID, it's a huge drop, but you know, the question is, is, is resiliency is still there? Um, maybe even you see a big drop, it, it will come back. It's, a, it's, a, it's historically been very, very resilient, <clears throat> according to all the research, including my own. But if you see, see it, uh, you gotta look at this aspect is, where is this coming from? Uh, the book will go into much more detail into all the elements of the drivers of supply, demand, increases of, of each one of these uh, different areas. But uh, on a very top level, this, the, this data is from Boeing, by the way. Uh, and on a very top level, you can see, historically, it's, it's been cash, right? Normally, you buy aircraft with cash. Where is this money coming from? You, you can buy from leasing. You can have back and get it from bank debt from the capital markets like uh, structured finance uh, aspect. And uh, insurance aspect is, is, a new, is a new innovation in the last few years. So the, and uh, lastly, I, I did, forgot to mention, is the export credit agencies who are uh, in the US, it'll be USXM, it'll be the ECAs and other ever respective countries. But these are the players that come in where they really try to um, help with export of the major goods, which is aircraft. Uh, as, and, and they're the most prevalent during times of distress. So I, I would envision that, that there is a giant need for it today, as well as the fact that uh, uh, there has not been available for the last few years, given the political uh, uncertainties in Washington and uh, inability to get appointees and quorum to actually do deals. So now it's, it's back up and running, so it's a question is, can, can it continue to get back up to speed where it was before? And you can see, you can see from this, this, this line, this orange, uh, orange line. No, historically it's, it's represented close to 30%, you know, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of funding. So it's, it's a very significant aspect uh, of, of the financing space. Um, <laughs> this uh, is interesting. So this is a, a chart going back to 2003, uh, 2003 so right after the dot-com uh, dot uh, bursting uh, of the bubble. Uh, but you could see 
kind of what the cautionary and, and what each of these elements uh, represents. And, and even today, uh, today everything would be of concern really. Uh, it, it, the, the entire spectrum is, is, is uncertain. But uh, if you look at 2018, 2019, it's actually quite, quite, uh, quite robust, uh, satisfactory. Yeah, the only thing is you can see is that there's concern with the ECAs that we just talked about, export financing. And, uh, and, and, and the airframe side, there's, there's always a, a reluctance of uh, the uh, OEMs uh, Airbus, Boeing's uh, of the world trying to help uh, with supply, uh, support financing wise of their own, uh, of their own uh, products. They're, they want to sell. They don't want to be financing uh, themselves from that aspect. Here's another topical uh, couple of left. Why, why am I focusing on this? I think it's a quite an interesting dynamic and I think this is uh, an area that will rebound quite aggressively in, in the next uh, few years. Well, there is a huge gap of funding uh, that will be required uh, today. So, <clears throat> so for those people who don't know, when you go and buy an aircraft, you, you get list price. You, they give you a sticker price, basically. But most people don't really pay the sticker price. And why is that? It's just because that's a, an aspect you have to show some, something. So there is a lot of negotiation of, of discounting of some sort or other other support packages, other aspects that will help. Uh, this graph is what I have collected uh, over a long period of time, and and this sort this sort of stuff, uh, by the way, uh, you know you can't really come back and get. It's, it's actually very very hard to find because <laughs> it's it's primary data. It's it's it is, uh, has collected over time. But you can see over all the major aircraft types. It's quite um, quite interesting. It's it's generally a pretty much a a, a inflation plus uh, aspect where you're, you're increasing it generally speaking and uh, list price wise. Because remember, again, if things are bad, then maybe the, uh, the the dynamics of the net price will be different. So how does this relate to um, the net pricing that people pay? Well, look, if, if you're ordering large large quantities. Of airlines, uh, aircraft, excuse me. Then, then they, they that will uh, probably give a really good case for increased pricing and, and other aspects. Maybe they something there's out of favor aircraft they want to keep uh, keep keep uh, producing, so they're incentivizing people to to order more. Uh, so things like this will will keep up kind of really kind of actual prices. But in in all form, people are are want to keep prices high, right, and they keep the factories going, especially the. Uh, the Supply rates have, have gone up, especially aggressively, but especially the last, I would say, 10 years or so. <clears throat> so how do we get into research? So we'll get into the, to, to the more kind of the, the quant side of things. Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to go super deep into this because uh, I think there's too much nuance that needs to be explained in, in, a, in, a, in a short webinar like this. So what I do is kind of give you kind of the overarching thoughts. Uh, as I just talked about, you have lots of aircraft. We were just talking about new aircraft, right? New aircraft pricing. Aircraft is a, is a depreciating asset. Book, uh, book depreciation, 25 years of useful life. Uh, there's a lot of arguments about economic uh, useful life. Basically, how long is, it, is this asset uh, usable so it can be rented out and produce income? Uh, if, if it's shorter than the actual life, then, then you have to be able to depreciate the, the asset faster. What does that mean from a, from a finance group point of view or, or an investor's point of view? If you have to depreciate your asset faster, you have to have a respective increase of rental to compensate for that. And of course, you'll add in your required return or your, uh, your risk uh, adjusted elements that will be added on top. So this this whole rental stack, if you add it all together, would, would need to be higher than it would be otherwise. Uh, and this is uh, one of the primary aspects. It's a it's a very basic element of, of the research is is how have pricing done over time. 
there has been no um, rigorous study of this uh, at all. Uh, there's a lot of um, industry uh, parlance and, and, and thoughts about this, but there's nothing rigorous. It would be the first rigorous research from this book. And then you can see something like this, this, this example graph, uh, is you, you see observations of old aircraft and, and, new, uh, and also pricing. Uh, and, as a, and you look at it as a percentage of a, con, um, as a, as a, percentage of a, of a new price. Why do you do this? is because if you have it just as, as, as dollar, you don't see kind of really kind of depreciation curve. So you really look at it from either a percentage point of view or a dollar amount to say, hey, where is this kind of depreciation curve and how fast is it really kind of affecting things? And that will help drive uh, uh, the modeling, et cetera. Uh, so these are just some of the, the, the basics behind it. But, but uh, the, the main point is this is, a lot of different aircraft. Do you segment it differently? Do you segment it as a uh, narrow body, small aircraft, big uh, jumbo jet, uh, two aisle, twin aisle, uh, wide body aircraft? Or do you, is it regional jets, smaller sub 100 uh, seat aircraft, or turboprops, uh, propeller planes? So these are all different classifications that you can put up. And even within the, the uh, we'll call it the mainline jet cases, the narrow body and the wide body, there are actually, you can call it really kind of multiple generations of technology that exist. So if you want to sit sub-segment it even further, the first generation technology, uh, the new, well, we're in today, where we're in the, uh, in the, in the Neo is in Maxis, but really that's, that's quite new. So what the previous generation would be the, the, the NGs, the 737 NG class next gen, uh, classes, so as well as uh, the more, uh, I guess now called uh, A320CO family, classic engine op option uh, family. So these these aspects really kind of pave the way of, of also your analysis. Um, I, I I don't I don't want to get you to the uh, to the uh, statistical and other aspects. I think I'm not sure what the crowd is for for this uh, for this session. But I want to just kind of give you kind of all these different dynamics of of, of this. I think one of the major things I think uh, um, I, I, one of the one of the major aspects I would say from a uh, one of the major aspects of, of looking at this is is how is it going to compare, and that's also a, a big part of this book. Is looking at how does this look at from an asset perspective compared to other kind of like industries, which is basically have heavy asset, you know, real estate, uh, commercial real estate, residential real estate, all the um, shipping, uh, farmland, all the real asset classes, and how does it look? Uh, I see um, someone just asked a question. What I'll do is I will uh, elaborate on that uh, more in, at the end uh, in the Q and A side. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I, let me get to the next, uh, uh, the last part of this uh, uh, this presentation, which is on COVID, uh, aviation COVID. Uh, I think this is big on everyone's mind. Just to give you kind of a recap of what's going on. Um, this is the worst economic case uh, in many respects. There's really, you know, really this outbreak, just uh, I'm sure you guys all know, uh, in, in January really kicked off. And, and really in the beginning, this kind of kicked off, uh, I take a more Asia uh, aspect because the question is, it's very, very delineated. This is kind of what's happening in, in China domestically and what's happening in other parts of the world. But uh, just to give you, uh, for those who don't know, both OEMs have uh, completion facilities in China. There's, it's, it's, um, it's supporting the, the local need for aircraft. And there's, the airlines are still continuing to take aircraft uh, today, uh, even during this, while a lot of other airlines have decided to push back and delay orders or, or just temporarily freeze, freeze in. Um, no big, no big, um, uh, this is looking back at really kind of what happened in the January timeframe, but basically no big surprise, big, big drop. And actually from a GDP point of view at that point, uh, it was still a lag period where people were still pretty bullish on, 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 the, on the Chinese economy, kind of hemmed and hauled a little bit, but uh, 
uh, it's, it's quite more aggressive today, but uh, back then it was a, quite a big scare and the, the stock markets uh, uh, reacted quite aggressively. But really kind of February is, is really kind of where you see the big drops and you see kind of what happened with uh, all of capacity. So first, the first thing that cut, cut really was the international capacity. And even today, uh, that capacity has not come back up. If you look at it around the world, uh, it, it's really hovering around the 10 to 15 percent mark, and that's the same in, in, in from, a, from a Chinese airlines point of view. But uh, you know, one, one, uh, two, two first cases. One is H and A Group. It, it got de facto taken over uh, because by, and now it's uh, the provincial government, Hainan uh, provincial government. Uh, government is, is really uh, controlling things on, on the very top. So is this a factor of COVID? It was a, it was a work in play, but uh, this was the, the final straw. And, and then really kind of, if, this, uh, if you consider that the first one, the second one will be the from Flybe. It's a, it's a regional carrier airline out of, uh, out of the UK. But again, is it, was it because of this only? No, there's all, all sorts of history behind it. But uh, these are the first cases in today. We'll get into it in a little bit. This is it's close to close to 50 airlines that have uh, entered Chapter 11 or uh, restructuring or, or even uh, liquidation at this point around the world. Um, all around the world, Asia was first affected. Back then, up until March or April, the U.S. and the rest of the world were, were feeling okay. But this, um, I've been writing about this, the, the spread of this uh, aspect, yeah, even back in January, February, uh, in the opinion pieces. So while you felt uh, insulated out in the U.S. Or, or Europe back then, it was just a matter of time, in my perspective, uh, seeing what was happening on the ground and, and the viral nature uh, of, of this uh, pandemic. One interesting thing is the oil. Oil, you can read all about kind of the effects as one of the drivers in the book, but basically the oil itself has actually dropped quite a bit, right? This, you would think this would really help uh, airlines, which it does, because it's one of the largest drivers of cost. But at the same time, this doesn't help because if all your aircraft are on the ground, you're not flying them. You're not saving any money. On top of it, you might, you're probably losing money. Why? Because you probably have some hedges, oil hedges. You fixed out kind of your cost base. You think oil is going to increase. So what, what does that mean? It's going to pay out heavily in terms of oil, uh, oil uh, hedges, uh, these swaps or, or, or other options basis. And uh, so this, instead of helping, really kind of, uh, really kind of helped it. Uh, helped it. Uh, most, uh, I would say, not, depends on, on the airlines, but uh, a lot of airlines, I gave it up because they lost too much money, uh, such as Delta, but uh, other places, uh, other folks still use this quite, quite aggressively. There's been successful cases, of course, like uh, back, in, back in the oil, last oil one, the uh, Southwest did uh, made out very well with their kind of smart positioning, but uh, others didn't fare so hot. Uh, where we are today, very, very, <clears throat> very, very uh, uh, internationally, uh, supply of aircraft have all decreased quite, quite significantly. Airlines have lost a significant amount of money. And uh, this, is, this is, you can see just on a stock market basis, what, how airlines uh, have formed compared to uh, S&P 500 and, and, and MSCI World, which is more of a world uh, uh, equity uh, index. So it's still done very, very poorly uh, on a relative basis. One of the hardest hit industries uh, still today. And the industry group, uh, IATA, puts out these uh, kind of global uh, uh, outlooks. And you can see, looking at starting in February, and this was just you, uh, China, you can see China Asia centric. And, and, uh, and, 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 and subsequently has actually uh, dropped even further, but uh, stopped giving out that as much detailed uh, basis because uh, uh, people just, it's, it's not, going very well, uh, so they stopped doing that. But basically, you can see how aggressive uh, this kind of pushback is, and as people kind of realize, wow, this is really so uh, so bad on a, on a global scale, not just really initially thought as, as, a, as a regional scale. And, th and this is why, by the way, that initially the SARS aspect comparison was quite, 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 uh, quite on in, the, in a lot of the sentences. But after a while, you could see that this was not uh, uh, 
was not uh, uh, this was not going to uh, end quickly. Uh, this one, uh, this no, no. So this is just a re uh, basically at each point of what they expect the global loss would be for the year. So it's looking at the same time, but it's just kind of estimates over time. Uh, so, so you can see kind of where things are and, and then and how more pessimistic has they gotten as, as over, over the, the period. So that was a question, by the way, uh, about whether this is a cumulative or not uh, kind of uh, metric. Uh, here's, a, here's an example um, of, of, of what's, what's going on. But what this is showing you is, is it's very, it's not, it's not one directional. But it's very much a global aspect of this, uh, and if you continue this on to to, to wherever it is today, it, it's it's around 50 aircraft. It's it's quite uh, encompassing all around the world. South America being and Central America being hit and probably the worst uh, relative uh, aspect uh, from from airline fare their point of view. One one really interesting aspect of this, which hasn't actually occurred from the other, is is how much government support you know that CARES Act. The, uh, and also the how much uh, how much additional support the industry has been successful, and you can see look at the, the sums here. It's it's quite a, it's quite a, it's quite it's quite intense in terms of how how much it really is. But this is I would say unprecedented in nature, and the governments have responded. The U.S. As you can see by the by the total is the highest up there, um, uh, over a hundred plus, and this is uh, both confirmed and unconfirmed over time, where they just talked about, it, but it hasn't been uh, fully uh, confirmed by the government. So if you look at this total today, it's it's come up to over 150 billion, uh, and uh, and as more countries have, have realized, this is a bigger, important segment, and and on top of it, uh, uh, the recent news is. The the air uh, the government currently today has, has not renewed the, the CARES Act, so that's an interesting interesting point. Um, let me just talk a couple more questions, and then I think I think my time is up. But basically, the international and domestic side. This is a kind of looking at kind of uh, oh, uh, supply and demand over time. But you can see you can see what's happening is basically. Everyone, if you include domestic, it's come back down. It's kind of slightly come back up now because there's more more uh, impression of people wanting to uh, have increased flights, so they're increasing capacity. But what what you're seeing, if you look at it on a separate basis, is that look, uh, this is the domestic side. The countries with with big uh, uh, economies and able to uh, support uh, have actually rebounded generally pretty well. In Asia, that's all. Most of them have done pretty well in that respect. Uh, U.S. obviously uh, is trying, but there's a there's been a lot of uh, I would say confusion that's going on. So that has not gone as well as other parts. In Europe, uh, this talk of travel bubbles had really started up, but it really hasn't. But in in, in Asia, this this aspect is now starting to kick into gear uh, and, and for a uh, recovery. China's actually really good. It's coming, come, now it's come back to pretty much 90, 95% of uh, capacity line. And then the load factor is good. But remember, all this doesn't really, these graphs are, by the way, are all um, supply driven. One other thing you have to really kind of think about is what about pricing? <laughs> this doesn't really talk about that at all. So, so these, these aspects, uh, you got to keep this in mind when there's a lot of talking heads out there talking about these things. So keep it, keep it in perspective. Internationally, you can see it's pretty similar all around. This is not going to open up until there's some sort of uh, uh, more efficient way of uh, guaranteeing safety uh, as, as people want to travel. There is an inherent demand in there, but uh, people are, are scared. Uh, SARS, I would say, look, um, you can read more about it, but I think the biggest thing I would say compared to SARS and other aspects is that what, what, what we're happening today is it, it was good in the beginning, but wasn't it's, over time. This is global, much more global independent aspect and uh, it hasn't, hasn't kicked in. I think that the death rates, the fact that it just went away in six months in, in, in Asia, really, um, you can only hope that this would, would happen as well with COVID, but that's uh, you can't, you can't count on that, right? So these are uh, aspects. So it, it was a pretty quick uh, V-shaped recovery from that, but it doesn't look like it's gonna be a V-shaped recovery this, this time go around. Um, uh, 
What, what's what, what's different in, 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 in a lot of different cases? Well, in, particularly in China, it's very, very different. Uh, the economy was very much booming. It's very much um, uh, different uh, expected out, outcome and, and growth pattern really coming out of uh, really the WTO uh, at that point. So the, the numbers were actually very, very small quantum wise compared to where it is today. So <laughs> it's, it's less than 10 times uh, as small back then. So you could see kind of a comparison of where uh, this has uh, changed over time. Uh, one thing I would say is looking at, the, at, if you say, look at that, that was very much a health related aspect. What about the, what about the financial crisis? This is a loss in confidence, right? If you think about it, global policymakers, companies have a huge loss of confidence. What happened? What does that mean? Big fall in, in, in price and uh, in, in, in growth, but but basically that's mostly a lot of premium travel has come down. And if you see it during this time, this is also the case. Not only there's no real business travel period today, um, there's not much economy uh, economic why uh, 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 demand as well. So this is aspects that are, are, are similar in this case, but uh, not similar that it's a global pandemic. So it's not just a loss of confidence of, of money, but uh, the fact that there's health involved. So it's a it's more uh, nebulous effect. Uh, big, big losses, of course, you can see with with, a, with all this. Uh, again, similar you know, since the last shock, there's a oil uh, price burst back then as well. So that helps uh, ease the recovery space. Uh, as well. So what does this mean? It's not a direct com comparison either, unfortunately. And if you even look at it going back even further in 9-11, not, again, security uh, and, and, and confidence aspects. So these are all kind of uh, uh, aspects. And I, I would say, what, what, what do I think is probably the most, most uh, uh, reasonable comparison? I would say actually the 1970s uh, oil shock. Why? 1980 flu. Uh, aviation really was only uh, starting with a right price about uh, 10 years ago. So, so that, that really kind of, there was no aviation space back then. And really, the oil shocks stopped business in, in general. Uh, yes, this is even more, uh, I would say, more, more uh, intensive version of that. But that's how the closest we've gotten in terms of a global aspect, uh, et cetera. It's not pandemic, it's not health related, but it really kind of stopped. Uh, had the same effect in terms of the stock kind of business in, 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 in that respect. So, so what uh, before we get to the Q and A, I would say uh, to sum it up. Look, uh, you can see the book has a lot of different aspects into it. I would say I'm looking at the drivers. I explored all the drivers and what's going on, the dynamics, the what's happening today with COVID. What's uh, uh, a look historically of what's happening with with uh, the uh, the, the pricing of, of aircraft as an asset class. And then if you look at it together, comparing it with, with other, um, other asset type uh, benchmarks, see how well that does. Does that fit in well as an addition to your portfolio perhaps? So these are, these are all lots of different questions. And I would say for myself, this is a five year kind of work in progress. And I, 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 can, I, I look forward to continuing extending on this and, 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 and looking at more especially given with all what's going on with COVID. It's uh, uh, something that I keep uh, tabs on quite frequently. So with that, I think, uh, oh, one minute. So I'm pretty, pretty, pretty right on. So with that, I, I will uh, move up to uh, Q&A. Uh, so I have, Okay, so I have a couple questions here, so I will answer those first. And then if you guys have any more, we can talk about it. Okay, uh, uh, so first question is, is now a good time to invest in this space? Which publicly listed era do you think will are well run? Mm. So uh, I would actually say, if you're interested in that question, I would actually refer you to one of my working, uh, my papers published by uh, KBMG. Uh, so, uh, but basically looking at kind of what, what, what has gone on with public leasing companies. But I would say look at this, um, two ways to look at it. Just like I said, there was a lag period uh, in terms of price effects and kind of what, how it gets built in. Same thing today, we, uh, there's, there's, 
is there is a lag effect in terms of kind of uh, when you see pricing. This is not aircraft by in nature is 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 not traded all the time, right? Like a house is not traded all the time. You can only get estimates of such. So in, in essence, you see points in time and make inferences. So same in aircraft. So I would say there is quite a bit of lag still today in terms of pricing uh, that I see. Uh, so so as as a as the only ISAT certified appraiser, senior ISAT certified appraiser uh, based in in Asia, I think this aspect is really kind of key of how people look because uh, as you can see from the data, why is it why am I the first person to do this to look at this and, and establish it? In fact, it's because there's this very lack of uh, transparent data, first off. And second, there's not, it's very hard to collectively get a more kind of a global aspect. You can see each company puts out uh, these metrics. And um, so, but it's very hard for them, people to come together. So I think that was one of the hardest parts of this. So I really thank my data contributors uh, who provided the data sets to, to actually carry on this from a more scientific and rigorous standpoint. Uh, to your second point of uh, less orders run well, well look, uh, there's a lot of big companies in the space, and then there's, uh, I would say, there, I would call it, there's a lot of big companies, there's some medium companies, and then there's some um, dedicated uh, vehicles, publicly traded vehicles, uh, mostly out of London. So these are the three types. And so if you, if you want, if one is more actively managed and the others are more kind of run down type managed. So, it depends on kind of what you're looking for. Uh, I'll, I'll say this might be a better, uh, in terms of better, uh, who, who is a better player. I'll let that um, people, other pundits put that in. But I'll say this, is it a good time? I just think that is your aspect of a kind of risk reward. We haven't kind of gone down in this presentation. Right? It's more of my very macro kind of aspect. But I would say, look, just ask yourself these questions. Do you think there's any more kind of volatility in terms of residual pricing, like pricing aspect, the underlying aspect? And what about the rentals itself? So we haven't talked about anything about credit, <laughs> credit other than airlines itself, but these airlines, who are you getting rent from? What happens if they have? So these, these are the quite kind of questions you gotta kind of consider. So um, I think from, from my general perspective, I think there is the lag period is not yet fully baked in. So there's probably more time the question is just more kind of intermediate volatility, whether that kind of implies or not uh, on that. So that, in a general sense, is, <laughs> is good. So is it is it is a good time to invest in space? I would say getting there, getting there uh, is my, 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 my take. Um, I answered the second question, is there a cumulative loss? Okay, third question. Kelvin asks, can you comment on what the impacts will be if national carriers or large airlines will go left, will go, be left to go bankrupt? And how interconnected are financial markets related to the aircraft industry if left lenders don't accept restructuring factors? Where, where do those planes go? Hmm, great question. Okay, so first off, what's the impact if large carriers are left? Question is, let's say, let's see the US, right? Um, none of them are state owned, right? They're all private, what happens? Then they go through their normal restructuring uh, aspects. So chapter 11, hey, is there, can it get restructured? Um, or not, if not, then there's gonna get liquidated and then the lenders and, and, and the various capital stacks will uh, get what they can get. Is this a bad thing? You can argue about national utility and global overall utility, uh, but is one less going to affect the overall chain? It, it really depends, but I would say, look, uh, probably in the U.S., not going to matter so much. The only problem is, I guess, from the fact that if there's only two remaining big two, how would that affect their aspects and what decisions they would make? I think that's kind of the, 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 kind of the game plan. Look, since what? Since June, the airlines, global airlines, have raised over $120 billion. Uh, it's been one of the largest kind of fundraising aspects. Also, it's equity, bonds, and everything. Uh, everything's got to go. Raise as much as possible. Okay. So the second part of this question, what happens if there's restructuring and they can't accept? So basically, they'll, the airlines will, will literally just give the planes back to them. So the, in, in most cases, if the, if, the, if the equity is all wiped out in, in those respects, then the lenders own the company. 
right? In, in normal kind of corporate environment. And in this case, they would own the, the planes if they're lending directly to planes. And most of these, by the way, are non-recourse type debt. So you can't go after, uh, so there's a, you can't pierce the veil. This is, you can only look after kind of the asset, the company itself, you can't go up above that. So also the limited liability sets and things. So, um, so in, in, in the net aspects, they will own it. So what they'll try to do, they'll try to get as much value for it. What does that mean? They'll try to sell it down, they'll, they'll, or they'll, they'll, if they can't find a good way, a good value, they might decide other methods of, hey, maybe we can uh, employ it, try to do value added services, et cetera. So I expect lots of activity in, in, in this space, um, in this space going forward. All right. Uh, I know I can talk a lot, a lot more about that past question, but uh, I don't think time is with us. Um, how is the drop in RPK affecting uh, aircraft valuation? Again, um, people realize, look, there's a, the airlines are, are in a very much a tight bind where you kind of pause, the demand is hugely affected, right? So valuation-wise, people realize this, but how much is, is baked into this? Is this, from a valuation point of view, is this a temporary fix or is this a kind of a long-term aspect as in is how much it, that's the kind of question from a valuation force perspective um and and this kind of looks at is this a long going ongoing basis that base value or is this much more market value so taking to this supply uh, uh supply and demand imbalance so uh are you seeing airlines defaulting on leases well let's put it this way at the moment Everyone, pretty much all of them have asked for rent deferrals, rent holidays, uh, financial restructurings. So pure defaulting, not as much actually. I'll say most of them are, are trying to restructure first. Everyone's kind of on that, that same boat. But you can see by the number of airlines, yes, at those levels, they are defaulting uh, by, by definition. So, uh, and even for the ones who are in technical defaults, uh, late in time payments, et cetera, the people have so far been pretty uh, uh, still uh, understanding uh, of things in terms of uh, providing some cushion and not enforcing all the rights or, or even just going in and taking, grabbing the aircraft back. So those are quite, quite interesting perspectives. So we'll, that I would say is the next big thing. So when that big kind of hammer drops where they all start growing and grabbing the aircraft, that's gonna have severe uh, consequences on, on, the, on the valuations themselves. Questions: Where are you going to put them? Where, do, where, where are they going to go? That's that's the ultimate question. Next question from Jim: Is the aftermarket for four-engine aircraft as freighter is viable? Greater, uh, okay, good question. There's a right now. So the best, hottest market since January: freighters. <laughs> uh, in terms of PPE. Uh, your protection equipment. Hey, by the way, if you guys are really interested in that, you can read about my Forbes article uh, that I wrote uh, a while back ago about the, about the PPE market. And uh, it's quite, quite, quite actually interesting. I, I have an ongoing uh, uh, arrangement writing some thoughts on, on Forbes. Um, so yes, that's it's, it's definitely a viability. Seven fours, uh, the question is how much can you use it? Right now, there's, there's a huge amount. But remember, converting each of those passenger 74s uh, or, or others, A380s, will cost a lot of money. So that, that's, that's the aspect. So the question is, do you believe in, in the Bible? Is it a bad aircraft? No, it's a great aircraft. Very, very big. But how much uh, can you fill it all the time? That's, that's actually more of the ultimate question. One thing that people don't realize in terms of freight market, excuse me, <clears throat> Is that mainline airlines, you know, how they go, there's, there's actually a lot of underbelly space that can be also used as transport. Actually, that underbelly space actually represented, I would say, actually half of all cargo freight, not just dedicated freighters. So that's actually quite interesting. If you take that, if you've taken that out, you basically artificially kind of, right, increase the demands, same or even maybe elevated, and your supply is way down. So that's quite a big factor in that space. So I think it's definitely a viable. Uh, John, hey, uh, John, uh, John asks, uh, 
Lessor seems to uh, be an important source of aircraft demand in the last 10 years. What happens to lessors going forward and how does it impact asset isolation? Great question. And same, I think that kind of goes back to some of these other points. I really think this, the lag period has not really kicked in yet. Uh, and, and, and mostly, look, is, is it because they've done a bad job of the, the valuation folks who, who do this, uh, like myself, uh, do this all the time? Have they done a bad job? No, it's, very, it's, a very, it's a very tough one because there's not much trading actually happening. All the trading that's happened is actually uh, basically uh, remnants of deals that was done before COVID and they can't be stopped because investors need to get it. The financings can't be stopped. So they just keep doing it. So this, uh, and what happens with a lot of lessors, I think it's gonna be pressures. Definitely gonna be very big pressures on, on lessors. And I, I've always said, this is a huge effect. I wouldn't be surprised if a uh, uh, couple of top 10, top 20, 15 lessors uh, not do well uh, in this and need to restructure. So this is how serious uh, this, this is. So uh, impact values, we just haven't seen it yet. So I think this lag effect is definitely happening. And, and there's been a big impetus of, of a holding uh, uh, the fin financiers actually being very patient. Most of the time they're not, they just go and grab your assets. But so far there's been a patience uh, exhibited all, all throughout uh, the financing spectrum. Okay, next question, Wayne, uh, how does crash change valuation? Yeah, so similar question. So I would say, look, at the moment, there's definitely uh, estimating downward. It's it's continuing happening. There's not much trading act activity going on, so there's not much kind of price discovery. So this has been the biggest aspect. So it, it will continue to happen, and it will have uh, more more effects on, on on decreased valuation. That's for sure. And it's uh, just like any big uh, effects, it'll have big effects in this program in terms of asset values. Remember, when you're at lever 80, 90 percent on these things that will have great huge disturbances on the equity itself uh, potentially wiping them uh, wiping them off uh, leaving the the, uh, the lenders uh, in control okay next one uh, anonymous what uh, metrics would you look to call the bottom when it's time to invest uh how do you recommend putting money to work look um I guess, look, you can look at a macro picture, uh, picture wise of putting money into work in the sector. You should, I think the best way is looking at it is how much, uh, how much downside protection are there? How much, how much credit risk are there? That's the, one of the biggest things at the moment. You can't, even if you, you can get your aircraft back, where would you put them? So you, you basically, it's, it's like, it's like if you're renting, if you own a house apartment and you're trying to rent it and then, oh, the renter leaves, how hard is it to get another credible renter? Uh, or credible is, is the right word because you can always give it to someone who doesn't pay and that, that doesn't quite work well. Uh, so I think macroly speaking, that's quite an important aspect for me. Uh, underlying uh, value, asset values, actually what are you pricing these things at? That's quite important for me. So I'm a much more of a bottoms up fundamental kind of guy. But if you don't have that you know, expert expertise, I think it's more of an aspect of when do you think the linchpins of, of, of overall kind of uh, environment uh, from the airlines and, and, and referability with with a with a time lag uh, built in from that point of view as a just one very general sense. Uh, a couple more questions. So, non-COVID situation, would it be purpose? It would be correct to assume that investment in aviation debt is more sensible than airline stock and airline stock. Hmm. Okay, so that's two different things, right? So aviation debt, I'm assuming, is you're considering kind of more uh, aircraft specific debt. So, so senior secure, secure uh, asset secured debt, debt, more sensible. They're two very, very different things, right? Fundamentally speaking, I'll say airlines is a very difficult industry. If you think about it, what, what do you have? You have supply demand. So the supply uh, demand side, you're you can see it's a huge drop today. But what, what do you also see? Your cost side, the problem is the cost side is not flexible, right, as enough. You have huge CapEx costs, planes, infrastructure, whatever, whatever you got. But, but if you look at kind of the pot, fuel is a big point. Can you hedge it? Not really, that's, that's kind of what you're seeing. And people who try to hedge it have not historically done very well. So 
you have that. You have your uh, your, your fixed income, uh, fixed cost, your, your aircraft, your, your your leases, et cetera. You have your uh, your people costs. You have your infrastructure costs, et cetera. So this is not super variable to to as much as we need today in the space, and. So, but that creates a lot of volatility, right? So if you're, it depends how you invest, but if you like investing in, in, in like the high vol, um, high volatility uh, type of uh, stocks, and that might be better for you. Investment in debt. I think, look, even on debt, it's all about price, right? What do you go in at? From my point of view, if you have debt, but you're giving them 100% leverage, that's not that great in this environment, right? When asset values have, <laughs> have dropped uh, potentially, you know, 30, 40%. So question is always kind of where you get in and how much comfort level. And if you do get your aircraft, the question is always kind of almost on drawback. If you get your aircraft back or you get your asset back, whatever debt it is, can you dispose of it? Can you get, can you sell it? Can you use it so that you can get your money back? So that's, that's, uh, well, that's essentially kind of what if scenarios, I think today, even from an investor, if you go invest in aircraft, you give it to the airline. If the airline goes belly up, when you have to take it back, or you need to take it back, so what do you do with this? That's 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 going to be a big, big challenge here uh, from that aspect. So if, if you're not getting, if you you think that's going to ha highly hap uh, happen, are you getting enough compensated for that lease period, that premium, and are you getting it? Are you writing your aircraft down fast enough? So those are lots of uh, uh, interesting things to think about. Um, next question. Um, prices function of uh, supply, supply, it, uh, supply and demand. It would seem that there is ma massively oversupply. How does this new massively impact uh, price? Has the industry internalized the reality that in co uh, corporate 50% volume, 40% revenue is permanently impaired going forward? All right, so I. I, I I totally, I agree there is definitely an oversupply today, right? There is many, many naked aircraft that are available and not in need of taking it because they're all kind of full on with their own aircraft that they have already existing. So that's been a, that's been a, a, a big issue. I think it's gonna take a while for that to kind of go through. This is kind of that lag effect I was talking about earlier, kind of how to work through the system. And they all naturally will because the price, the natural price discovery will Force upon them and, and really force upon them. And there, were, there are people willing to buy. It's about it's around the right price. So mm -hmm. I think this will work itself out. Uh, the question is how much initial volatility is there in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning. So the second part is has the industry internalized the reality that corporate uh, corporate is permanently impaired? I don't think I don't think uh, industry has internalized that at all uh, about the, uh, the permanent impairments. Uh, I think that to me is a big, <laughs> it, it, it is big, it is big. Uh, uh, and, uh, so that uh, I, I think it's it's getting there, but I, I I think people are still more hopeful rather than the fact that they think it's permanently impaired. Uh, I, I I think it's getting to that level, but. Um, yeah, but uh, a lot of people are still in a very kind of uh, still hazy mode, I would say, uh, into the reality of things. Um, all right, so last uh, one more question. Why do you think Boeing decided to move all 787 productions to Charleston uh, from Garrett? So, <clears throat> so easiest, easy way to think about it is, is is this lack of demand, right? If you're, if you got lack, if you got this kind of what I just said was basically this oversupply, and you don't have enough orders, you and you have two um, facilities doing the same thing. Why do you need two? So consolidation of it makes sense. And it, and why Charleston? If you look at look at what happened before, even when they were starting this up, the seven eight seven line back then, it was uh they were they actually wanted to just have it in Charleston, but then the uh, Washington site kind of really got kicked off and politically, et cetera. And there was enough raw from the unions, et cetera, that basically uh, had them open up the second site. And demand was good for a while, but this is, this is not gonna, this is not gonna you know, disappear overnight. So to me, the question is almost, is this helping them? This is helping, the aspect is, you don't wanna lose your skilled labor, right? This, that's hard, they can go in mechanics, et cetera, or, 
focus. They can go do other jobs. You don't want to lose that uh, institutional memory. But at the same time, you'd rather save the, save the line and not, and not, <laughs> not have both and the, the whole product not doing well. So not surprised that that ha happens. And I actually, I, I actually will, uh, I expect to see a lot more actions from the OEMs themselves. There is, they also like the airlines and the uh, aircraft leasing financiers have very, very fixed costs and their, their kind of development chain is even longer. So maybe not the tier one people who have the most trouble, but the tier two, three, four, mom and pop shops, those will have severe consequences. Uh, and you're already starting to see that reputation. They're not getting paid. They're, there's no, they don't have very uh, much outlook. What will happen? They have one, two customers, very few customers. Uh, because they're, they're basically selling up the, the supply chain. So what will happen? That's gonna be a tough one. So I think uh, I think that's it. So what time is it? Okay, 36, so pretty good on time. All right, look, uh, I think I've answered anything. So unless there's anything else, I will uh, hand it off back to uh, Jamie. Thank you so much. This was great. Uh, it looks as though we're about out of time. And we'd like to thank you, David. You were amazing. Thank you for your time and your talent. And we'd also like to thank all of you for joining us for this evening's program. A follow-up email will be shared with you that will include a recording of the program, along with a list of resources in our event schedule. We hope you'll join us for a future program. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate it. Take care. Thanks all, and uh, thanks Celia and Jamie for having me. And uh, if you guys want to email me later, you can email me. Uh, I just put the uh, email on my screen. So uh, take care. Have a good evening over there. Bye bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye.